Hello, I'm Tad Larkin, host of the YouTube channel Mandalore, and you're watching this on my secondary channel, Captain Fordo. Bet you thought I was done talking about Star Wars The Clone Wars, right? Yeah, so did I. But hopefully, this video will be a bit more fun. At least it will be for me to make at any rate. And with Star Wars The Clone Wars coming back for a seventh season, congrats to them, I thought this would be a fun topic to talk about for a change. In this video, I will explain how I would have made Star Wars The Clone Wars if I were in Dave Filoni's position, discussing things from the art style, to character portrayals, to just how I would have made it fit better overall within the continuity it was meant to exist within. Now, before I get too far into this, let me just reiterate something I've said in all of my videos. I'm not saying that Star Wars The Clone Wars was bad, it just did not fit into the existing canon at the time, and with that as my main reason for making this video, I would like to imagine what it would look like if this show actually built upon the established lore of the time, instead of just retconning it. As established in my videos, Why Star Wars The Clone Wars Doesn't Fit in Legends Parts 1 and 2, the original run of Star Wars The Clone Wars 2008-2012 notoriously introduced a plethora of continuity issues into the existing canon at the time. And yes, the expanded universe was canon. That's a fact. The result of this, combined with the rebooting of the Star Wars franchise's continuity in 2014, many now believe the fallacy that the Expanded Universe, now rebranded as Legends, was a giant mess with no continuity whatsoever, and, as I explained in my video, The Truth About the Expanded Universe and the EU Movement, the Expanded Universe did have continuity, quite an intricate one, just not after TCW introduced lore-breaking continuity errors and retcons. Now, arguably, a second Clone Wars series was never really needed. The franchise already had one fantastic Clone Wars series that tied in with a whole multimedia project of books, comics, and video games that told the tale of what happened during that three-year period between Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith. The Clone Wars was an already oversaturated era of the canon by this point. But since I'm now traveling back in time to 2008 and putting on Dave Filoni's shoes, if I have to make a second Clone Wars series, I'm going to make one that flatters the rest of the franchise, and adds a layer of depth, rather than just bulldozing over the established lore and creating continuity issues with the rest of the canon. Before I get into stories, settings, and characters, I'd like to first establish what kind of art style we should use for our ultimate Clone Wars TV series. As much as I would love to do this live action, especially because for years George Lucas had been teasing fans with a high probability of a Star Wars live action series, it doesn't seem plausible to get big name actors like Ewan McGregor and Samuel L. Jackson for a TV series set during the Clone Wars. The budget would have to be astronomical. This leaves our only options as CGI or traditional 2G animation. One of the problems with the 2008 Clone Wars series, which, for ease, I will refer to from here on out as TCW, is that they had such potential using CGI, but chose a rather outlandish way of representing characters and objects. In the pre-production, TCW was originally meant to tie into the original Clone Wars animated series, which is why we see things like unnaturally pointy beards on Obi-Wan and Count Dooku, bulbous heads on the super battle droids, and Anakin's butt chin and anime hair. It's meant to be cartoony. These things worked for the OG Clone Wars cartoon, because Gendy Tartakovsky's art style and character choreography works for traditional 2D cell animation. One only has to look at Samurai Jack for evidence of that, and we see influences of Samurai Jack in Clone Wars. He was able to maintain his art style and still make the cartoon feel like Star Wars. And so it was kind of important to us to create a style where it spoke true of Star Wars and uh, related to it but it also had its own visual point of view. George Lucas really liked the art style in Clone Wars, and as he says here in the featurette, Connecting the Dots, he was looking into moving into that kind of animation, obviously for future projects, so it's safe to say that Gendy's art style was a major influence for the art style in TCW. The thing that attracted me to it, it has a slight anime feel to it, and I'm very interested in anime, and I was really interested in moving into a kind of animation that was very different from anything we'd done in the past. 
and um, Gindi is very good at bridging that transition between traditional animation and anime. However, as soon as you bring that art style into a 3D medium, it feels less believable and less like Star Wars and ruins what they're trying to achieve in my opinion. Granted, the CGI does improve as TCW progresses into the later seasons. We see the animation become smoother and the lightsaber duels are less choppy and rigid. However, the cartoon-esque art style applied to the character and vehicle models remain the same, even as the environments and effects are rendered in more realistic style. It creates this conflicting theme between cartoon and realism that just screams, to me at least, we don't have a consistent theme. If we must do CGI in our ideal Clone Wars series we're building here, I want to maintain a cohesive theme. I'd also like something more realistic in style. And what really interests me is the cinematic trailers for the Star Wars The Old Republic MMO. In 2011, we were blessed with this amazing CGI cinematic, Deceived trailer for the upcoming Bioware MMO Star Wars The Old Republic. And after that, more trailers ensued, causing a severe case of gaping mouth amongst my friends and I in the lunchroom of my local high school. The amazing thing is, the CGI was so well done that it arguably still holds up today. Disappointingly, the actual game didn't end up looking anything like the trailers, but I still love the trailers to death, and that's what I'd like to do for our Fantasy Clone Wars series here. I could go on about how smooth the animations were, and the realistic facial features on the characters, and the lightsaber choreography, but I think the clips that I've been playing from the trailers while I've been sitting here blabbing speak for themselves, and make a strong enough case on their own for why this should be the art style we use in our series. <laughs> With our art style now established, we can move into what the setting will be for our Ultimate Clone Wars series. Apart from the obvious physical setting of our Clone Wars TV show, which is of course the Star Wars galaxy and the established locations within it, as well as whatever new locations we can imagine, I think it's important that we establish just what exactly the span of the series is. We have three plus years of galactic history to work with after all. Like with the art style problem, one of the problems with TCW is that it was originally meant to tie into the original Clone Wars series, more specifically during a time gap of a couple months before the war's end, between Anakin's knighting in Chapter 21 and his mission to Nelvan in Chapter 22, represented in the OG Clone Wars series by a brief montage of Anakin being heroic. By the time the TCW movie was released, the writers obviously moved away from that idea, opting to start the series at the beginning of the war right after Attack of the Clones, and this presents problems with the established lore and messes with the continuity, mainly because of Anakin Skywalker, and the fact that he was Obi-Wan's Padawan for most of the Clone Wars in the established lore. Yet, in TCW, he's depicted as a Jedi Knight with his own Padawan right after Attack of the Clones. It just causes a whole slew of continuity issues when trying to fit the show in with the established lore, and TCW itself just pretty much throws out the established lore anyways. So, that's a mistake I would like to avoid in our series that we're building together here. I'll talk more about Anakin later when I talk about characters, but for now, since the time period our show takes place in is already oversaturated, I believe this show should follow different events than the ones already depicted in the books and comics, but still be presented in a manner that doesn't mess with the established continuity of the time. If this series is going to be successful, we need to keep it entertaining for those who are not up to speed with the established lore, i.e. never read any of the books or comics or played the games, yet fresh and new for those who have already digested the established material, but at the same time not trampling over what is already there. If I'm going back, erasing TCW, and starting this from scratch, I want this series to tie into and coexist alongside the established lore, adding a layer of depth on top of it, rather than just bulldozing over and replacing it. 
I think our best course of action is to start our series at the beginning of the war, either at the Battle of Geonosis itself through other characters' perspectives, or immediately after Geonosis, and from there follow new events that may be taking place in other parts of the galaxy concurrent to the established events, and have it lead into Revenge of the Sith, and possibly... If the show does well and keeps getting renewed for more seasons, explore more of the Dark Times and Jedi Purge period. At the same time, there's definitely some events from the comics and books that I would love to see on the TV screen, such as the infamous Battle of Jabim, one of the Republic's most devastating defeats. And I do think we could get away with showing some of those events, but instead of focusing on the main characters during those events, we could explore what different, lesser-known characters were going through at the time, or our own characters we create as I will elaborate later. At the very least, we should reference established events in dialogue to give the episode its frame of time and where it fits in the overall lore. Maybe something like, while General Kenobi and Padawan Skywalker are leading forces on Roxas Prime, we need you, name of character here, to go do this, yada yada yada. Obviously the dialogue will be better written than that, I'm just spitballing. Basically, to sum it all up, I want to keep it fresh, while putting in some events from the established lore for the fans that may have read those comics and books, or played those video games, or remembered that scene from the OG Clone Wars series, strengthening the continuity of the overall canon in the process. Again, adding a layer of depth rather than depicting something completely contrary to what we've already seen. Add to the lore, not overwrite it. If we are successful in this endeavor, and our show is granted the ability to go into what happened after the Clone Wars, and provided in this alternate history George Lucas never sells Star Wars, I think this would be prime territory, given that the Jedi Purge era was relatively unexplored at this time. I argued earlier that a second Clone Wars series was never really needed, and I stand by that, because in 2008, we had this whole new era that was open to us with the completion of the film saga after Revenge of the Sith three years earlier, and we could have explored more of the Jedi Purge in a way that the Dark Times comics couldn't and didn't. But no, we had to go back and see the Clone Wars again, apparently. Imagine, we switch focus from our main characters, who could possibly be Jedi, as I'll theorize when I talk about characters later, and we pan over to Lord Vader, and his early missions to hunt down and eradicate remaining Jedi survivors of Order 66. We can even have the show lead into the events of The Force Unleashed, and show Vader finding Galen Marek on Kashyyyk, and maybe even go a bit more in-depth on his training as Vader's secret apprentice. Which would be perfect, because The Force Unleashed games are coming out during this time in our real history, giving us a marketing opportunity. And of course, the early history of the Rebellion can be explored, although it wouldn't be a full-fledged Rebellion at this point, given that the Rebel Alliance doesn't form until two years before A New Hope, as depicted in The Force Unleashed. It's still an idea that can be toyed around with. All that being said, we can confirm that our series will start at the beginning of the Clone Wars and lead into Revenge of the Sith, focusing on events in other parts of the galaxy away from the main heroes, i.e. Obi-Wan and Anakin, with the goal of setting up the Jedi Purge era and possibly exploring more of the Dark Times if permitted. Our art style and setting is now finally established, and with that we can move on to characters and just who our Clone Wars series will be focusing on. The obvious two characters that come to mind when one thinks Clone Wars is of course Anakin and Obi-Wan, and as I've said many times in previous videos, TCW's depiction of Anakin and Obi-Wan, more Anakin than Obi-Wan I'll specify, I have found many problems with, and honestly made Anakin a boring character in my opinion. Since they made Anakin a Jedi Knight to coincide with their original idea of having the show taking place during a time gap in Clone Wars that I mentioned earlier, TCW has Anakin start off as a Jedi Knight with a Padawan of his own, right after Attack of the Clones, which raises some questions. We all know Anakin was still a Padawan at the end of Attack of the Clones, so just why specifically did the Jedi Council, in all of their infinite wisdom, decide to knight Anakin without him having proven himself worthy of a Jedi Knight's position, let alone charge him with the responsibility for a 13-year-old Padawan learner? 
After disobeying Obi-Wan to stay with Padme on Naboo, disobeying Mace Windu to stay with Padme on Tatooine, slaughtering a whole village of Tusken Raiders, which Yoda felt through the Force, by the way. Young Skywalker is in pain. Terrible pain. And disobeying Obi-Wan again, charging headlong at Dooku with no backup, thus allowing him to get away and sparking an intergalactic war on a scale not seen for a thousand years. <gasps> What about any of that screams Jedi Knight material? The justification that later source books and TCW tie-in material, as well as Disney-owned Lucasfilm's new canon used, was that they needed more Jedi Knights, thus more Jedi Generals, after the Battle of Geonosis. Which is understandable, I suppose, but given his behavior in Attack of the Clones, Anakin should be your last choice for Jedi Knight material, chosen one or not. In the original Clone Wars series and the comics, books, and video games of the Clone Wars multimedia project, Anakin experiences a more organic and natural character progression, from the whiny brat he is in Attack of the Clones to Venerable Jedi Knight in Revenge of the Sith, and it's established that he's knighted two years and six months into the war, rather than immediately after Attack of the Clones, allowing the character a more realistic time span to grow up and mature over two and a half years of bloody battles, daring rescues, and suicide missions. This again presents problems with TCW fitting into the established continuity, because all of the books, comics, and video games that feature Anakin in them that take place before that two years and six month nighting date depict Anakin as still Obi-Wan's Padawan. This is a clash we want to avoid with our Clone Wars series. Which is why, for the early episodes that feature Anakin, he'll still be depicted as Obi-Wan's Padawan, rather than a Jedi Knight. And once we get into the later episodes where he is a Knight, I don't believe giving him a Padawan of his own to look after is a good story idea either, for the same exact reasons I explained when talking about his unlikely early knighthood. That, and because it would just be too close to Revenge of the Sith at that point anyways. Unlike the OG Clone Wars series and TCW, I would ideally like to focus even less on Anakin for our series. As far as I'm concerned, Anakin's story has already been told. Through the movies, the OG Clone Wars series, the books, the comics, the video games, the story doesn't need to focus on Anakin anymore. We already know what he went through. Anakin and Obi-Wan must be recurring cameos, however, and will no doubt get episode story arcs focused on them as the series progresses. I just don't want them to be the show's primary focus. Kind of like how TCW did it, but picture a few less Obi-Wan and Anakin episodes. For the Anakin and Obi-Wan themed episodes, there are a few character goals that we absolutely need to hit if this series is to flow seamlessly into Revenge of the Sith. 1. We need to see Anakin and Obi-Wan's master-apprentice relationship evolve into their fellow Jedi to fellow Jedi friendship that they have during Revenge of the Sith. With Anakin starting off as a Padawan still at the beginning of our series, we have the chance to show him as the brat he was during Attack of the Clones. I'm going to tell you this right now. You are going to hate Anakin. He's going to make foolish decisions that will make you say, Why didn't he just listen to Obi-Wan? Sorry, sir. Your signal is breaking up. Padawan, if you... As the series progresses, we'll see Anakin mature a bit. Obi-Wan will loosen up on him, and leading into his knighthood, Anakin will become the hero with no fear, we see depicted in Revenge of the Sith novelization and other expanded universe material. Past his knighting, Anakin will begin to see Obi-Wan as less of a father figure, and Obi-Wan will see Anakin less as a rebellious teenage son, and more of a brother in arms. 2. Their relationship with the clone troopers will need to be depicted. TCW did a good job of this in my opinion, but I think it would be more interesting if maybe Obi-Wan was a bit more wary of the clones in the beginning, more reluctant to rely on this army of strangers that suspiciously showed up out of nowhere, and gain trust in them as the series goes on, which would make the Order 66 betrayal and Revenge of the Sith sting all the more. 
Anakin could be on the other side of it, instantly warming up to the clones and forming brotherly bonds, perhaps even learning things from the clone troopers, making him a more effective commander and later general. In the early seasons, we could introduce Alpha-17 from the Star Wars Republic comics, and of course, my favorite, Captain Fordo from the original Clone Wars, and develop their characters more and their relationships with Obi-Wan and Anakin. Maybe even go more into Alpha training the next generation of clone commanders as he did in the Star Wars Insider Holonet news articles. The later seasons, after they graduate from Alpha's training program, we'll see more of Commander Cody and Commander Oppo, and to develop their relationships with Obi-Wan and Anakin. And lastly, I think it's important to show Anakin's knighting, even though we already saw it in the original Clone Wars series. But doing it in a longer series versus a mini-series gives us the opportunity for more deliberation in the Jedi Council Chambers over whether they should knight him or not, and recap past episodes through flashbacks as they debate weighing his mistakes against his victories. This is also a good opportunity to show how Obi-Wan was granted the rank of Master, something we don't see in either shows, and his rise to a seat on the Jedi Council. Yes, it's inter-Jedi politics, but it's world-building, which is what the prequels were in essence. As for depicting events from the Clone Wars comics, novels, video games, and original series that center around Obi-Wan and Anakin, I'd like to avoid that. Not only just to keep things fresh, but to avoid continuity errors. However, we can depict some of the battles they took part in, maybe focus on more of the ancillary characters during that battle, or view the battle from their perspective, rather than the perspective of Obi-Wan and Anakin. For example, in the OG Clone Wars series, we see the epic Battle of Munilenst, where Obi-Wan and the Ark Troopers face off against Dirge, while Anakin commands forces in space and dogfights with Asajj Ventress. There is another character fighting on Munilenst alongside them, Valuf Mon, who we only see briefly during the ending of the battle. Valuf Mon was created for a Cartoon Network fan poll, which would decide which new Jedi character would be featured in Star Wars Clone Wars Chapter 20. Valuf won and was seen for all of 30 seconds during an action sequence, and other than a brief appearance later in the series, we know nothing about him. Perhaps our Clone Wars show can have an episode arc focusing on this character, establish who he was, what he was doing on Munilenst, and how he contributed to winning the battle. I know what you're thinking, who the hell cares about this Wolf-Man character? And you would be right for thinking so. That's why I used him as an example. You don't care about this character, you don't care what happens to this character, but if this character were a bit more developed and fleshed out, he could potentially become one of your favorites hypothetically. That's what I'm trying to illustrate here. We obviously don't have to use Wolf mon I just thought he would be an interesting example. Stuff like that is all well and good for one-off episodic story arcs, but I think for the series in its entirety, I believe we should have our own character or tight-knit group of characters we can call the main characters, who a majority of the series can focus on. Whether we do a Jedi, or a smuggler, or maybe a squad of clone troopers and their Band of Brothers-esque journey through the war, I believe whatever we do for our main characters, they should be completely original. That way, we can create new events for these characters, as well as being able to slip them into established events with little to no repercussions on the continuity. We could even do a combination of the three. Have one character be our main Jedi character, a smuggler character, and a squad of clone troopers. And we can jump between their stories, kind of like how Game of Thrones jumps between its characters as they're spread out over Westeros. We can do the same in the Star Wars galaxy. With our Jedi character, we have the chance to view the war through the eyes of the Jedi. What does he or she think about the war? About the role of the Jedi as generals? Does he or she maybe consider joining a separate Jedi sect, like Dejin Altus' Jedi sect? Or maybe even defecting to the CIS, like Sora Bolg and Tol Skor did? The Jedi character allows us to question the morality of the Jedi Order and the Republic. And maybe, even if he or she disagrees with it in principle, he or she continues to fight until something sets them off. The role of the smuggler character allows us to view the war through the eyes of the private citizen. What kind of financial opportunities does the war present for our smuggler character? 
Maybe he or she is presented with an ethical dilemma at one point, and has to choose between a lucrative business deal that could make them rich, or running supplies past a CIS or Republic blockade to aid the needy citizens of a beleaguered world. Maybe he or she has to consider joining a side at one point, and with that we can explore what the war was like for normal people on both sides of the borders. The Clone Squad gives us the chance to view the war through the eyes of a soldier. Part of me wants it to be a squad of regular clone troopers. However, if we do a squad of clone commandos or ARC troopers, they're canonically more independent than the standard rank-and-file troopers, capable of a wider range of free thought and ability to question orders. One thing that annoyed me about TCW is that the show often depicted grunt troopers that were established to be less capable of questioning orders committing acts of treason and desertion, something that was established in both Attack of the Clones and the books and comics to have been highly unlikely. They are totally obedient, taking any order without question. We modified their genetic structure to make them less independent than the original host. And who was the original? Our best course of action is probably a commando squad. That will allow the audience to connect better with the clone characters. However, we need to differentiate them more efficiently. I don't want them to be carbon copies of Delta Squad and Omega Squad from the Republic Commando game and books, though they could appear as cameos. All four of them need their own unique personalities with different combat roles, specializations, and equipment. Maybe they lose a squad mate along the way, and have a new guy rotated in their unit. Maybe they don't like this new guy, but they learn to like him through trial of combat. We can have them question the morality of using clones bred for combat to fight for a republic they're unsure they'll even be able to live in after the war. Does the republic even see them as people, or are they just slave soldiers ripe for the slaughter? What do they think about the new equipment being issued to them and fellow clones towards the end of the war, such as Phase 2 clone armor? Do the commandos get attached to a specific Jedi general? If so, do they carry out Order 66 or do they refuse? When the Empire is established, do they desert the army and try to live normal lives, or do they continue to serve the Empire? These are themes that can be explored through the clone characters. If we're going to create new protagonists, we might want to consider making our own antagonists as well. And lucky for us, there's plenty of room to develop our own characters fighting for the Separatists. There are heroes on both sides, after all, as stated in the Revenge of the Sith opening crawl, and I've come up with two ideas. One concept that wasn't shown much in TCW is the existence of other Dark Jedi besides Asajj Ventress. In fact, in the books and comics and video games, Dooku had a whole cadre of Dark Jedi whom he tempted to his side, calling them his Dark Acolytes. Among the Dark Acolytes were Asajj Ventress, Severance Tan, Tol Skor, Sora Bolg, Kadrian Zay, and even Quinlan Voss for a time, so I think there's room for one more. Our Dark Acolyte character could be the main antagonist for our Jedi character. Maybe he or she is a former Padawan to our Jedi character, seduced by Dooku and brought to see the faults of the Republic and the hypocrisy of the Jedi Order. Perhaps one of the goals of our Jedi character is to seek redemption for our Dark Acolyte antagonist and bring him or her back to the light side of the Force. The Dark Acolyte's motives could be similar. Perhaps he or she seeks to turn the Jedi character just as Dooku had turned to them. Or maybe there's some personal vendetta or unresolved issue with the Jedi character. Another antagonist type I'd like to explore is a minor CIS general or task force commander. In TCW, we're introduced to quite a few non-droid commander characters, like Murr Took, Admiral Trench, and Worm Lorthsum, something that I really appreciated them including, seeing that it was more than common in the previously established material to have non-droid CIS commanders. The beauty of the Confederate General-slash-Commander character is that he-she could be the antagonist for all three of our protagonists. Perhaps our Jedi character is a general with his or her own clone battalion to command, and our CIS General character and him or her share some sort of rivalry and meet on the battlefield often, 
Our smuggler character could be on the run from our CIS commander character. Maybe he or she even ends up working for him or her at one point. And maybe our commando characters are tasked to assassinate or capture this CIS commander character at one point. Next, we're going to talk about existing characters that I would like to make an appearance in our series. For the already established characters, I would ideally like to depict them in the same way that they're depicted in the source material, which was another problem TCW had, but I'll get into that later. Apart from the obvious Mace Windu, Yoda, and the cavalcade of other easily recognizable background Jedi characters from the prequel films that will no doubt be playing roles in this series, there's one character that doesn't appear in either Clone Wars shows, nor the pre-existing material, and he needs to. I'm talking, of course, about Rom Kota. Rom Kota was a major character in the Star Wars Force Unleashed games that came out around the same time TCW did and was still airing on Cartoon Network. And he is arguably one of the most badass Jedi characters to grace video game consoles since Kyle Katarn. In The Force Unleashed, we learn that Rom Kota was a Jedi general during the Clone Wars. Only, he was extremely distrustful of the clones, and opted to raise his own militia forces to combat the Separatists. When Order 66 is issued, his militia refused to carry it out, being loyal to Kota, which allowed him to survive, leading the militia in guerrilla warfare against the Empire. Not including Rom Kota was one hell of a missed opportunity on TCW's part, and if I'm in Dave Filoni's shoes, or hat rather, I'm not going to miss it again. This gives us the chance to explore a younger Rom Kota and his struggles with his militia during the war. Did he face any backlash from the Jedi Council for refusing to use clones? Did his army fight in any battles alongside any clone armies at one point? And if so, was there any tension or rivalries between non-clone and clone units? These are questions that we can answer with this series, strengthening the continuity through connections with the Force Unleashed. Speaking earlier of CIS Commander-type characters, how could we have a Clone Wars series without General Grievous? General Grievous first appeared in Chapter 20 of the original Clone Wars series, and our first impression of him was that he could hold his own against seven Jedi at one time. He was a complete and utter badass. The combined affiliated comics, novels, and Holonet news slash shadow feed articles in Star Wars Insider portrayed Grievous as this killing machine and tactical genius. He was truly an indestructible master of war. Now, the problem with Grievous is that during his conception, George Lucas described him to all of the EU content creators as a perfectly capable Jedi killer, in the words of Paul Rudish. By the time the final draft of Revenge of the Sith was finished, George had changed his mind about Grievous, wanting him instead to be a cliché cartoon villain who flees in terror whenever his dastardly plans fail. Uh, you know, because I think George hadn't really locked down exactly what he wanted to do with the character for Grievous. Yeah, and what, the way George pitched Grievous to me was that he's kind of one of those old, you know, B-serial uh, villains where he does something bad and then he, you know, twirls his mustache and runs off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He always escapes. <laughs> but before that, we had been told that he's like this ruthless, totally capable Jedi killer. So right. it's like, well... <laughs> yeah, I think he was still kind of working on working it. Working it out. Yeah. So uh, what we did is we just had Dooku explain, you know, this is why... And for us, and to also explain to the audience who may have been concerned or wondering after seeing the first batch, like how he could take on these Jedi. Gendy and the Clone Wars team adjusted for this, toned back Grievous for the final season of Clone Wars, and added a scene where, during lightsaber training, Dooku instructs Grievous to be more cautious and to flee whenever the tactical situation is deemed untenable. This worked for Grievous, as we had that explanation for why he was so badass in the original cartoon and comics, and why he performed so lackluster in Revenge of the Sith. We had that bridge in his character to explain his change in behavior. Remember what I taught you, General. If you are to succeed in combat against the best of the Jedi, you must have fear surprise and intimidation on your side for if any one element is lacking it would be best for you to retreat you must break them before you engage them only then will you ensure victory and have your trophy 
TCW, however, took George's final idea for Grievous and brought it down to comedic levels with how incapable the character was at performing even the simplest of tasks. Throughout the series, we see all of Grievous' plans fail miserably. We see him defeated in open lightsaber combat by a single 13-year-old Padawan. And we see him embarrassingly taken captive by a group of Gungans. A stark contrast indeed from the original depiction of Grievous. The original Grievous ate Padawans for breakfast. If we're erasing TCW and going back in time and redoing it essentially, I want a balance between George's original idea for Grievous and his final idea for Grievous, where we make him a perfectly capable Jedi killer and tactical genius he was depicted in the source material, while at the same time having him twirl his metaphorical mustache and run away when and only when his plans are foiled, which will be seldom in our series. I want to portray more of the tactical genius side of Grievous as well. You must remember that this character is essentially the Grand Admiral Thrawn of the Clone Wars era, and it's even established in the old canon that Thrawn studied Grievous' tactics, and even had Grievous' faceplate in his art collection. With this series, we're going to do the Grievous character justice, while staying inside the confines of what George wants the character to be. Report, General. What news from the front? The strategy is working perfectly, my lord. The Jedi and their forces are stretched thin across the Outer Rim worlds in a vain attempt to contain our new offensive. Good, good. There are a plethora of other established EU and film background characters that would no doubt be appearing in this series. And instead of talking about each and every one of them and explaining how to avoid the mistakes TCW made with them for our series, I'll just say this. My main goal, as established at the beginning, is to adhere to the source material, while keeping it fresh and entertaining. Characters like Quinlan Voss, Asajj Ventress, Evan Peel, Tarkin, Akbar, Yaluren, Barris Ophi, and others who had their character personalities and or origin stories butchered and maimed by TCW, those characters shall be portrayed correctly in our Fantasy Clone Wars series, with the correct temperament, social status, military slash government rank, species, homeworld, appearance, equipment, and so on and so forth. Don't expect Tarkin or Yaluren to show up as naval officers in this show, as Yaluren was a colonel in the Imperial Security Bureau, the Empire's CIA, in A New Hope. Dave Filoni only made him an admiral because he saw the white uniform and mistook him for a grand admiral proving Filoni knew nothing of the source material going into this. As for Tarkin, he was a lieutenant governor of the Sesuana sector during the Clone Wars, and if he does appear in our ideal Clone Wars series, he shall be portrayed as such. I think by now you get the gist of what I want to do with our new and existing characters, how I want them to be portrayed, and how we can write them effectively into our setting to tell deep and interesting stories. So now the question arises, just who is going to voice our characters? For our completely new characters, it's hard to tell at this point. We'd have to flesh out our characters a bit more, and then the best course of action would be to audition different voice actors until we find who fits for the different characters. The casting of existing characters is a bit easier, though. I actually don't really have a problem with most of the voice actors who starred in TCW. James Arnold Taylor portrayed Obi-Wan in both Clone Wars shows and did a fantastic job. Tom Kane did Yoda's voice for both Clone Wars series as well, and I find him pretty indistinguishable at times from Frank Oz. Mace Windu's voice actor, whose name escapes me at the moment, did a great job too. And of course, Anthony Daniels, the only Star Wars actor I've had the privilege of meeting, is usually down to do anything Star Wars related, so he'll always be 3PO. There's only a few voice actors I would change. Starting with Anakin, I can't exactly judge Matt Lanter on his acting ability, as I've only seen him in two things, TCW and Vampires Suck, which, spoiler alert, sucked. But I don't think he sounds anything like Anakin. He's kind of monotone and dry, and that could be attributed to poor writing and direction, not inherently the actor, but still, he doesn't sound a bit like Hayden Christensen. 
Matt Lucas, who voiced Anakin in the original Clone Wars series, as well as the 2003 Clone Wars video game and Battlefront 2, sounds scarily like Anakin to me in certain scenes. And on that note, listening to him scream in pain as he yanks out the power crystal from the Techno Union lab in the later episodes of Clone Wars sounds exactly like Hayden Christensen's screams of pain in Revenge of the Sith. It's scary. The other voice actor I would replace is D. Bradley Baker, for the simple reason that he just doesn't do a good job with the clones in my opinion. Not only does he sound nothing like Tamuera Morrison, but he can't even pull off an authentic sounding New Zealand accent. It just sounds like an over-exaggerated Australian accent. All I can hear when I watch TCW or play EA's Battlefront 2 is that fish from Spongebob who says, Well, maybe we wouldn't sound so bad if some people didn't try to play with big meaty claws. What did you say, punk? Big meaty claws! Well, these claws ain't for just attracting mates. Bring it on, old man! Bring it on! I'd ideally like to just have Tamara Morrison himself do the clones if we can financially pull it off. I mean, I don't think he was doing much in terms of film projects at this time in real history, so availability probably wouldn't be an issue. But if we can't get Tem, I'd rather do auditions to see if we can find someone who sounds more like Tamara Morrison than D. Bradley Baker. Our setting and characters have now been established, so who can we trust to write our Clone Wars series, making sure our stories and characters are entertaining and deep without overwriting the existing lore? Now, I know realistically that the people I'm going to name here probably wouldn't have had time to be brought onto a board of writers, as many were focused on other Star Wars related projects at the time TCW was being produced, but I think we can at least bring them on as consultants for the writers to obtain ideas from, and I thought who better to make sure that our Star Wars series is entertaining and consistent with the established lore than the writers responsible for building the Clone Wars era. Other than George Lucas, who, if we're going by what was done with TCW back in 08, will be producing our Fantasy Clone Wars series, one guy I know we need on our team is Hayden Blackman, who not only supervised the creation of The Force Unleashed, but also wrote quite a few comics for the Expanded Universe as well. Among some of the items on Mr. Blackman's resume is Star Wars Obsession a five-issue comic book series that followed Obi-Wan on his quest to find and redeem the dark Jedi Asajj Ventress, after learning of her heritage while imprisoned on her homeworld in the previous issues of Star Wars Republic. It was probably one of the more painful things to be retconned by TCW, as the comics were beautifully written and gave a fitting end to Ventress' story within the context of the war. With Hayden Blackman on our team, we can rest assured that interconnectivity between the show and the comics will be guaranteed, as well as when we get into the later seasons, since he'd be working on the Force Unleashed games around this general time period, he can give us insight onto what will happen in those games to help our series connect better and broaden the continuity. An author that I'd like to either have on or instructing our writer's board is Karen Travis, author of the Republic Commando novel series. Miss Travis I regard at least as the J.R.R. Tolkien of the Star Wars franchise, since she created the most complete fictional language within the franchise as well as developed an entire planet and culture for the Mandalorians, a feat that I don't think any other EU content creator can compare to. Sadly, Mrs. Travis left the franchise around 2010, if I recall correctly. Due to discrepancies between her Republic Commando novels and TCW, she was required by the licensing editors to completely rewrite Republic Commando to fit within Dave Filoni's version of The Clone Wars if she wanted to continue writing her sequel series, Imperial Commando. She half considered this before leaving, and given the tragic state of the Star Wars franchise today, she probably got out while the getting was good in my opinion. 
the heartless wretches running the franchise today don't appreciate her work anyways. Just look at The Mandalorian. But since this is an alternate reality, where I'm Dave Filoni, and we're going to write our Clone Wars series within the same context as her novels were written, i.e. the actual existing canon at the time, we shouldn't have to worry about her leaving on us. With Karen Travis on our team, we know that our clone troopers will be written correctly, and if any events of our show happen on Mandalore, or our characters meet Mandalorian characters, they shall no doubt be portrayed correctly as well. Someone else from the comic side of the franchise I'd like to have on our team is John Ostrander, who wrote a good number of the Star Wars Republic comics, which are probably my favorite comic series in the whole of the Star Wars franchise's history. Jan Dersima's gritty realistic artwork combined with Ostrander's storytelling capabilities made the Republic comics an absolute treat to read, and I recommend you read them as well. Ostrander is also known for creating one of the most iconic EU characters, Quinlan Voss, who, like so many in Dave Filoni's TCW, was portrayed incorrectly, causing inconsistencies with the rest of the canon at the time, which is something we're going to avoid with our series. Just like with Hayden Blackman, with John Ostrander on our team, we can be sure that our show won't conflict with the established comics, as well as getting some great quality stories out of the guy, and not to mention a completely accurate depiction of Quinlan Voss. Last person of note I would like on our team, even as just an advisor, is James Lucino, who, in my opinion, second only to Timothy Zahn, is one of the best Star Wars Expanded Universe writers, and not to mention, is pretty much the Jocasta new of the Clone Wars multimedia project, being the foremost expert in my opinion, and it showed through his novels. His excellent novels, including Labyrinth of Evil, Dark Lord, The Rise of Darth Vader, and Darth Plagueis, lead me to believe that we'll have no shortage of quality stories. With Labyrinth of Evil being basically the end cap on the pyramid of the established Clone Wars lore at the time, we can also be assured that he won't let our series conflict with any of the existing novels. And of course, for monitoring the overall continuity, I'd want Leland Chi on our team, Keeper of the Holocron, also known as the guy who is generally in charge for making sure the EU stayed consistent, both with each other and with George Lucas's film Hexology. Chi often advised Filoni during TCW's production, telling him, for example, that he couldn't use certain characters because they were dead. However, Filoni, more often than not, would go over his head and ask George Lucas himself, who would usually approve anything. Chi and the other continuity editors held no real power over Filoni because of this, and could really only advise him. If I'm Dave Filoni, instead of just being selfish, with no actual respect for Star Wars, the franchise as a whole, or the franchise's continuity, I'm actually going to respect the existing canon, and if I'm unsure if something contradicts the canon or not, I'm going to ask the chief continuity guy, Leland Chi, and abide by his advice. It's that simple. Pretty much everything is now in place for our Ultimate Clone Wars series. We have our art style, we got our setting, we have characters both new and existing, we have who will voice our characters, and who will supervise the writing of our stories. Now we just need to figure out who's actually going to watch our Clone Wars series, and how we're going to market it. This is the part where I know I'm just going to make people mad, but with a TVY7 rating, TCW wasn't exactly geared towards adults, and it showed through the dumbed-down dialogue. And I definitely want our target audience to be a bit more of the older kid to adult range than the kid range. This will allow our writing to be a bit more grown up, and our dialogue more intelligent. Now, as a 25-year-old man that unironically enjoys Spongebob and Adventure Time, I realize it's entirely possible for adults to enjoy kids' shows. I'm not trying to insult anyone's intelligence for telling them that the show they enjoy is a kids' show. I'm just facing facts. It was a kids' show. The OG Clone Wars show was a kids' show as well, and I still love it as fiercely as I did when I was a kid, perhaps even more so now that I understand and appreciate what it contributed to Star Wars, even if new Lucasfilm doesn't. I still want our series to be enjoyed by the entire family, though. I want the kids to be able to sit down with mom and dad and be able to watch the show just as much as I want mom and dad to be able to sit down and watch the show with the kids. I want to explore complex themes and have in it an appropriate amount of violence for a series that takes place during, you know, a war. And with Star Wars, fortunately, I think we can get away with that. 
The good thing about blasters and lightsabers are, they cauterize the flesh, leaving no blood. So, it hopefully won't traumatize the kiddos if we show something on the intensity scale of, say, the Battle of Jabim, which saw some of the most vicious fighting during the war. And, that being said, I don't think our ideal Clone Wars series is fitting for Cartoon Network. Maybe Toonami, but not Cartoon Network Daytime. I'd be more looking at a network like AMC or TNT. In fact, they did air a few episodes of TCW on TNT back in the day, if I recall correctly, though I don't recall if they kept airing them on TNT. With violence, even fantasy violence, comes language, and thankfully, things are a bit different in the Star Wars galaxy in terms of cussing. Throughout the books, comics, and video games, there are plenty of creative curse words that characters use that aren't real curse words in our language, such as Kark, Fearfeck, Blast, Sith Spit, Criff, Decut, Sheb, and so on and so forth. With such a creative fictional vocabulary at our disposal, we can rest assured that our characters won't be throwing around F-bombs, which helps bring our rating down to a more family-friendly level, yet still allowing our characters to express frustration in appropriate situations. At most, we'll get a suggestive dialogue content descriptor. So it looks like we're going with TNT as to where our show will be aired, but one thing we haven't yet addressed throughout this entire video is just what the name of our Ultimate Clone Wars series is going to be. You have to remember, it's 2008. We already have a TV series called Star Wars Clone Wars that ended three years earlier. Calling it by the same exact name as a TV series we already have causes confusion with the fans, and it's hard for fans to differentiate. Case in point, me in this video the entire time, taking extra steps to ensure I differentiate the two shows by calling one TCW and the other the original Clone Wars series. I shouldn't have to. I'm opting for something a bit more dramatic for a title, a bit more befitting of a Star Wars show. I'm thinking either Star Wars Fall of the Republic or Rise of the Empire, but I like Fall of the Republic better. It just has a better ring to it as well as a sinister yet tragic sort of focus. Fall of the Republic is relatively short, gets to the point, tells you what the series will be about, and establishes the time period the series takes place in, all with that four-word title. So, there you have it. Star Wars Fall of the Republic airing weeknights at 8 on TNT. Rated TV-14 for suggestive dialogue and violence. Last but not least, this is something that I feel is immensely important in anything Star Wars. Whether it's in movie form, video game, or TV show, the score is essential to establishing that it's Star Wars. With TCW, the score wasn't bad, it just wasn't memorable, other than the main theme, which was just a derivation of the main Star Wars theme. The fantastic thing about the prequel and original trilogy film scores is that they had amazing memorable themes and melodies that stick with you forever. As for TCW, the only theme I can recognize is the Christophsis battle theme from the TCW movie. Nothing else really stood out to me. I couldn't tell you who composed the score for the TCW movie or show, but I'll tell you who I want to do the score for Fall of the Republic, Mark Grisky. Though Mark Grisky has only two Star Wars items on his resume, they are considered by the fans as two of the best Star Wars game scores in the history of LucasArts, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2 and Star Wars The Old Republic MMO. If you haven't heard Mark Risky's wonderful scores for those two games, then you're in luck because I've been playing the music off the KOTOR 2 and TOR soundtrack for this entire video. You're welcome. Given Mark Risky's talent and what he achieved in KOTOR 2 and TOR, I'm confident that he can both replicate and derivate John Williams's amazing themes and melodies from the Hexology, as well as create new and memorable themes for Fall of the Republic. Fall of the Republic represents more than just one fan's bold idea for a fictional Star Wars TV show. It represents one possibility of what TCW could have been if it made more of an effort to exist within the established continuity of the time. It represents what could have been if people who were more passionate about the franchise as a whole, rather than just their story, were involved in making TCW. I said it at the beginning, I'll say it at the end. I by no means am trying to say that TCW is a bad show. I, personally, just found fundamental flaws with the show that didn't necessarily keep me from enjoying the show, 
but made it hard for me as a Star Wars fan who had watched the original series and read all the books and comics to take it seriously within the context of the Star Wars saga. It didn't, and still doesn't, feel like Star Wars to me. I hope you enjoyed this glimpse into what some of my thought processes are on what I would have done if I were placed in charge of creating Star Wars The Clone Wars, and if you agree with me or disagree with me, it's again just what I would have done. What I prefer to see in a narrative and character development, and my preferences for art style, acting, and musical choices. You are free to have your own opinions. If you're interested in learning more about the old expanded universe and what the Star Wars canon used to look like before the TCW retcons and the franchise reboot, click here and go to my primary channel, Mandalore, and give it a sub if you like what you see. Thank you.